today we will start a new topic that is preamble to the constitution of india the american constitution is the first written constitution to have a preamble the members of the constituent assembly in india has taken cue from the american constitution and the indian constitution also has a preamble in fact the constitution of india starts with the preamble on 13th of december 1946 pandit jawarlal nehru introduced the historic objectives resolution in the constituent assembly and in fact it was this objectives resolution was modified and later become the preamble to the constitution of india so what exactly is this preamble and what are the key terms that is used in the preamble and what is the utility of the preamble is the preamble an integral part of the constitution can the preamble be amended by the parliament by using its amending power under article 368 of the constitution so this is what we will have to understand under this particular topic so the first question is what is the preamble various legal experts and constitutional luminaries have different idea as to what this preamble is preamble is considered to be the preface to the constitution or an introduction to the constitution somebody has said that the preamble is a jewel set in the constitution in fact n palkiwala an eminent jurist and a constitutional expert he said preamble is an identity card of the constitution you get to understand the constitution by looking into this particular preamble welcome to the series indian polity by m lakshmikant i am babu gunashekaran faculty indian polity and governance study iq english i have secured all india rank 337 in civil service examination 2016 and i have also worked as an assistant commandant in the government of india briefly before that the idea behind this particular series is to help the students preparing for the civil service examination 2024 and also after that and also to help the students who are appearing for the other competitive examination because indian polity is going to be the same for all competitive examinations so let us proceed further and let us try to understand as to what is the preamble to the constitution of india so before we start discussing let us just go through the preamble as it is there in the constitution we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic and to secure all its citizens justice social economic and political liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship equality of status and of opportunity and to promote among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individuals and the unity and integrity of the nation in our constituent assembly this 26th day of november 1949 do hereby adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution so this is exactly what is the text of the preamble in the constitution very very important because this particular preamble summarizes the entire philosophy of the constitution it gives a lot of information as to what kind of constitution is the indian constitution it gives us an idea to understand as to what was the intention of the founding fathers of our nation that is the members of the constituent assembly and what they wanted to give to the people of this particular country so everything can be understood by understanding the key terms in the preamble in fact the supreme court of india has said that the preamble is a key to unravel the minds of the makers of the constitution so any doubt with regard to interpretation of any of the provisions in the constitution so how those things could be understood it could be understood by looking into the preamble and through the preamble by interpreting the other provisions of the constitution so this is exactly what we are going to study so before i proceed with the preamble just look into the preamble what are the basic information that you get it says that we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic now this sovereign socialist secular democratic republic is just one single composite word 
and we'll have to understand the meaning of each and every word. So, this basically gives us information as to the nature of our state, nature of our country or nature of the state as to what kind of country is India. It's a sovereign state. It's a state with socialistic ideology. It's a state with a secular characteristics and it is a democratic state and it is also a state which has the head of the state who is elected and that's why it is called as a republic. So, I'll try to understand the meaning of each and every word and also if you look further into the preamble, it gives us information that is the constitution of India wanted to provide justice, liberty, equality and fraternity to all its citizens and thereby ensuring the unity and integrity of this particular nation. So, this is basically the objectives in the constitution or the purpose that the constitution want to serve to the people of this particular country. So, what are the information that we get? We understand the nature of the state. We get to understand as to what is the purpose behind this particular constitution. And also then we understand the date of adoption. It is on 26th day of November 1949 that this constitution was enacted and it was adopted by the constituent assembly. So, we also understand the date of adoption. And then the preamble also gives us the understanding as to who is the source of authority behind this constitution. It is we, the people of this particular country. So, it is the people who has given the authority to the constituent assembly. So, in fact, it was a constituent assembly which has drafted the constitution of India. And but we know that the representatives of the constituent assembly was elected by the people. Although it was one of the criticism that the members of the constituent assembly was not elected by universal adult, adult suffrage and it was through an indirect election, but despite an indirect election, who was behind that? It was the people of this particular country and the members of constituent assembly were only representing the will of the people when they drafted this particular constitution. The constituent assembly which came into force, they express the will of the people, they worked for around three years. And then they drafted this great constitution, that is the constitution of India, which was adopted and then it came into force on 26 November 1949. So, it has the following characteristics, which the preamble to the constitution of India summarizes. So, as we will proceed further, we will try to understand one by one. But then the first thing that you have to understand is what are the key words that is given in the preamble. And then we will take up the further questions and we will try to cover up the entire topic of preamble. So, the first thing is to understand the key words in the preamble. So, the first thing is that the preamble says that we the people of India have resolved, solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign. So, what does it mean by a sovereign state? Now, India is a sovereign state, there is no doubt in that. So, what does it mean, mean by sovereign? So, sovereign means that the state is neither a dependency nor a dominion of any of the other state. When I say it is neither a dependency nor a dominion. India is a self-governing state. It is not only a self-governing state, it has its own head of the state. Unlike a dominion state, a dominion state is something, it may be self-governing, but it accepts the British crown or a representative of the British crown as the head of the state. Now, India was having this dominion status after independence, but till our constitution came into force on 26 January 1950. Today, India is very much a sovereign state. It is independent and it can independently take decisions both with regard to the internal matters within the country and also with regard to the external matters. Now, India can decide its foreign policy. Nobody can enforce anything upon India. India can decide its internal policies, the educational policy of our country, the economic policies in our country. Everything can be decided by the state without any interference by outsiders. And that is basically what is called as sovereign. So, sovereign means it is a supreme authority to govern its own people. There is no doubt that India is a sovereign state and that is also very much enshrined in the constitution and in the preamble to the constitution as well. Now, there are certain criticism that India is a member of United Nations organization or the international organization. Does it make India not a sovereign state? But the constitutional expert says that despite our members membership to the international organizations, India is still a sovereign state and that does not compromise on the sovereignty of our country. And as a sovereign state, this is also very important that the state being the supreme authority to decide, the state also has a power to acquire or to cede territory to a foreign country. 
India as a state, they can acquire a territory from the other parts of the country or from the other countries and it can also cede a territory to a foreign country. Say, for example, after the commencement of the constitution, India has acquired a number of territory. Puducherry was not the part of India at the commencement of the constitution. Puducherry was acquired. Not only Puducherry was acquired, India has acquired a number of other territories like Daman and Dayu, Dadra and Nahar Haveli, Dadra and Nahar Haveli, and there are also certain other territories which has been acquired by India. So, as a sovereign state, we have the right, the state has the right to acquire the territory and nobody can deny that particular right. And it can also cede a territory, it can also give its territory to a foreign country that can also be done by the state. When we say that it can cede a territory to a foreign country, we also have an example of ceding a territory to a foreign country. The latest example being the 100th Constitutional Amendment Act, which was passed in the year 2015 by which certain enclaves was transferred to Bangladesh. Certain Bangladesh enclaves in India and Indian enclaves in Bangladesh, that was the issue. So, whatever is the Indian enclaves in Bangladesh was given to Bangladesh. So, thereby we have also ceded a territory of our country. So, I will explain more about this enclaves issue when I take up the part 1 of the constitution that is union and its territories. But this is just to make you understand that what does it mean by a sovereign state? A sovereign state means it is a supreme authority and it can have full control over its people, its territory and the functioning of the affairs of that particular country, both internal as well as external. So, that is what is sovereign and India is very much a sovereign state. There is no doubt in that. Then the preamble to the constitution also says that India is a socialist state. In fact, this word socialist was not part of the original constitution, which is also again will be part of our discussion as to whether the preamble to the constitution of India can be amended or not. The word socialist was inserted into the constitution by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. It was a 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976 that inserted the word socialist into the constitution. And before that, if you look into the preamble, the preamble was only saying that we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic. Only these three words was there. But however, uh, it was a 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act that not only inserted the word socialist, but also the word secular, which I will discuss subsequently. So, the word socialist was inserted by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. It was Indira Gandhi who was the Prime Minister of India. And she was a pro-socialist and she wanted to send a message to the people of this particular country that the poor people will be protected by the government. And in fact, the state is biased towards the socialistic policies and to eliminate poverty and to eradicate the other form of uh, uh, problems in the society. And basically for this particular reason that she wanted to convey a message that the state is very much pro-socialist. And thereby the constitution was amended and the word socialist was inserted by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. So, what exactly is this particular word socialism or socialist ideology? Now, what does it mean by uh, socialist? Socialist means a state which is uh, having or uh, carrying forward the ideology of socialism, which means that there is a social ownership of the property, means of production and the property in that particular country. Now, when you say socialist, and if you see the kind of socialist system in our country. So, first what is socialist? It is a system where the state controls the means of production and the distribution. So, basically most of the means of production and the distribution in a particular country will be owned by the state where it is a socialist state. And there are certain states which follow communistic socialism which is an extreme form of socialism. The complete ownership is with the state. But India, we do not have a communistic socialism, we have a democratic socialism, wherein there is simultaneous existence of both the, the private ownership as well as the public ownership. But what and why we need this particular socialism, the idea behind this socialistic ideology is that if the state is able to own the means of production and the distribution of uh, such things, then the state can equally distribute the things to the deserving people. So, for example, in our country, there is a public transport and there is a private transport. The public transport is the railways, whereas the private transport, we have the airways and the other means of private transport. 
the private transport is much costlier but the public transport is much cheaper so that it can uh, it can satisfy the needs of the people and that's why that uh, this kind of socialism is followed in our country so that they can help the poor people they can eliminate poverty in the society they can eliminate diseases in the society they can eliminate inequality in the society so this kind of system is basically what is called as a socialist model but having discussed as what is a socialist model i am repeating it again that in india we do not have a communistic socialism but rather we have what is called as a democratic socialism which means there can be simultaneous existence of both private as well as the public means of production and wherever it is required the government will control the means of production and the distribution and wherever they feel that it is not very important maybe they can liberalize and they can give it to the private sectors so for example railways in operation 100% is with the state but airways has been privatized because the government knows airways can be afforded by the middle class people or the upper middle class people or the rich people but railways is mostly used to buy the lower middle class or the poor people and hence if it is privatized it may be exploited and that can lead to difficulty to the people there is government hospitals and then you have a private sector also there are government run educational institutions and then you have the private sectors also so this is an example of what this is an example of what is called as democratic socialism that is simultaneous existence of both public as well as the private means of production but on the contrary as i already said there are certain models of socialism which is also called as the community communistic socialism an extreme form of socialism wherein everything is owned by the state say for example the erstwhile ussr was following that particular model and then cuba is a country which even today follows a communistic model so apart from this not many states in the world they have this particular system and most of the states today either they follow capitalistic model or the socialistic model and india follows what is called as the democratic socialism and the very idea behind this particular thing is to eliminate poverty inequality ignorance and this is from the society there are number of provisions in the directive principles of state policy which is socialistic in nature say for example article 39b and 39c of the constitution deals with the redistribution of wealth in the society and the prevention of concentration of wealth in the society so this is exactly what this is an exactly a socialistic idea that the state can take measures to redistribute the wealth in the society and to prevent the concentration of wealth in the society taking the resources from people who are having it more and redistributing it to the people who are not having it now say for example the indirect taxation system in our country is an example of what you take the money from people where who are having more and redistribute it to the people that who are not having it sorry not the indirect tax system the direct tax system so the, the progressive taxation system because the indirect taxation is not progressive it is a direct tax which is progressive in nature that's an example of redistributing the wealth in the society many state governments in our country have come up with the land uh, uh, distribution act or the land ceiling act that's an example of what that's an example of a socialistic policy that has been taken by the state today the government of india is running big corporations the public sector undertaking and this public sector undertaking is not completely profit motive but it also has its own responsibility towards the people so that is all example of what these are all examples of the socialistic policies the state provides for subsidized food grains the state provides the health services so all these sectors are still controlled by the state so that's an example of what this is an example of the socialistic policy but doesn't mean that the state is having monopoly over all those things now please understand the state is not having monopoly over all those things there are also private players who will also carry out these services and people who can afford those services they can go and take those services but people who cannot afford will basically these services will be provided by the state so that these people who cannot afford for the paid services is not deprived of these services and thereby you bridge the inequality and the opportunity in the society so that's a very idea of this uh, socialistic model okay so this is the understanding that you should have in fact uh, there was a lot of criticism to insert this particular word socialist not in by the 42nd constitutional amendment act but in the constituent assembly in fact uh, the similar discussion happened in the constituent assembly also that the preamble should have the word socialist 
but it was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar who was not in favor of this particular model, although he said, he said that nobody can deny the fact that our constitution is pro-socialist. The number of provisions within the constitution which says it's, it, it shows it has a clear ideology to us, uh, the socialistic model. But he was opposed to, to this particular idea of directly putting this in the constitution, that is in the preamble to the constitution, because he said that any model that the, the state should follow should be based on the requirements and the needs of that particular point of time. But today there is a lot of inequality in the society. Probably we feel that this model is the best model to go ahead or to go with. But tomorrow, who knows, tomorrow the society might need a different type of model. Probably the capitalistic model will serve better the needs of the people. And hence, we should not put anything in the preamble, which means it gives an indication that the constitution is a uh, constitution which is always socialistic. It is not the case. And hence, let us not put this. But otherwise, yes, we do have a lot of socialistic principles and the uh, guidelines inside the constitution. Nobody can deny that particular fact. But what was not taken up by the Constituent Assembly was brought into the Constituent Assembly by the Prime Minister of India, that is Prime Minister Indira Gandhi by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act in 1976. So now with this understanding, we will move to the next key word in the constitution that is the word secular. So similar to that of the word socialist, the word secular was also inserted into the constitution by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act in 1976. So, when was this word secular inserted? So, this can also be asked as a question and it has been asked also as to which of the following words are inserted into the preamble by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. We will see that. So, already we have seen the word socialist and secularism has also been added by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976. And this was also inserted by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And she wanted to send out a message. In fact, 1976 was the era of national emergency in our country. The era of national emergency starting 1971 till 1977. And the third emergency to be very specific, 1975 to 1977. During this emergency, this 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act was carried out. 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976 inserted the word secular. And she wanted to send out a message to the people that this government will protect the poor people, inserted the word socialist. This government will protect all the sections of the people and there will be no discrimination whatsoever, irrespective of their religion. And this country is not only for the majorities, but also for the minorities. So this is the message probably the government want to send out at that point of time by inserting this particular word secular. So what exactly does it mean by the word secular? To put it in a very simple way, in nutshell, Secular means that the state is non-religious in character. That means the state has no official religion, religion of its own. The state will not say that it belongs to one religion or the other religion. Say for example, in India we have an official flag, we have an official language, we have lot of other official things. But does the state identify itself with any religion as an official religion? The state does not identify itself with any religion nor it can do so in the future. That is not possible. If they do so, it is going against the provisions of the constitution and you can say that there is no constitutionalism. It can never identify itself with any religion because the constitution provides for a secular state, the state which does not identify itself with any religion. But however in India, if you see that the state shall not identify itself with any religion, but the state can equally support the all the religions in our country. In fact, the state does not identify itself with any religion, but the state can take part in various religious activities. The state can support the various religious activities and when they support the religious activities, so probably they have to give equal support to all the religion. So if you ask me a question whether there is a complete separation between state and religion because there is no official religion. So does it mean that there is a complete separation between state and religion? Although the state does not identify itself with any religion, but you cannot say that there is a complete separation between state and religion, which is a model which is followed in the western country. State is different, religion is different. The religion will be taken care by the religious institutions, the state will take care of the administrative affairs of the state. The state will not interfere in the religion and the religion will not interfere in the state. And this is the model of uh, secularism that is followed in the western countries. And basically in the western countries also they are secular state and the state does not identify itself with any religion. But there, there is a complete separation model in countries like USA and some of the European countries. 
But India, however, does not follow this particular model. India follows a model of what is called as positive secularism. So, what exactly is this positive secularism? So, positive secularism is against the concept of negative secularism. So, negative means the state is inactive, the state withdraws itself from religion. But in India, although the state does not identify itself with any religion, that does not mean that the state will not take part in the matters of religion. The state can intervene in the matters of religion. In fact, it is a positive intervention. The state sponsored reforms has been brought in our country. Can we say that the state does not interfere in the religion at all? That is an absolutely wrong statement to make. What is true in our country is the state can intervene in the matters of religion and it can make a positive intervention. When I say the state can make a positive intervention, say for example, there are a number of state sponsored reforms in our country. State sponsored reforms. For example, when I take off space state sponsored reforms, recently the parliament has made a law and it has struck down the instant triple talak. So, instant triple talak has been struck down. When you say instant triple talak has been struck down, it is a religious practice and that religious practice has been struck down by the law that is made by the parliament. So, it is an intervention in the matters of religion. The state has made a law and it has prohibited dowry. So, dowry prohibition act has been passed. So, dowry was a religious practice under the Hindu religion, but now it cannot be practiced. So, dowry prohibition act has been passed. Prohibition of child marriage. Child marriage was a practice under the Hindu religion, but there is a law which prohibits a child marriage. So, can we say that the state does not intervene in the matters of religion? That is not true. In India, the state can intervene in the matters of religion positively to bring in reforms in the society. But that is not the case with regard to the Western secularism or the Western concept of secularism, where the state is completely separated from the matters of religion. In Western countries, if the church exterminates a particular individual or it does not allow certain members to enter, enter into the church and if a religious order has been passed, then the state has nothing to do about it. The state will not do anything about it. But that is not the case in India. India can intervene in such matters. That is the exact difference between the kind of positive secularism and negative secularism. And not only this, that the state intervenes in the matters of religion, it can bring in positive reforms. In India, if you see, the state can sponsor fund to the religious institutions. So, for example, uh, there was a news that uh, the government of Uttar Pradesh and the government of India has given some aid to build the Ram Mandir in Uttar Pradesh. The state can provide aid to the religious institutions. But whereas in the Western countries, the state cannot use its public money for a religious institution that is strictly prohibited. So, in case of India, when you talk of positive secularism, first thing is there can be state sponsored reforms. The state can provide aid to the religious institutions, but the only thing that the state in our country has to keep in mind is when they give aid to the religious institutions, the aid should not be given to one religion alone. It has to be given to all the religions equally. But in the Western countries, it is strictly prohibited. Now, the third difference, not only that they can give support to the religions and also that they can intervene in the matters of religion. In India, if you see, religion can be a basis of classification or religion can be a matter of public policy. When I say religion can be a matter of public policy, religion specific laws are allowed in our country. So, for example, we have Hindu Marriage Act for the Hindus, we have Christian Marriage Act for the Christians and we have the personal laws for the Muslims. But such things are not allowed in the Western concept of secularism where the law is uniform even with regard to their personal matters. So, if you distinguish between the kind of secularism that we have in India, that is the positive secularism in India and the Western secularism, that is a negative secularism. So, basically we can put down three differences. One, here it is based on the model of complete separation. There is a complete separation that happens in our country, but whereas there is no such complete separation. There is no such complete separation in case of negative secularism. Here there is an interventionist approach. But this intervention is in positive direction, intervention approach. Here there is no intervention. They are sub completely separate from one another. Religion can be a basis of public policy in India. So, in public policy, religion can be used, but there is no such religious based public policy that can happen in the Western countries. So, this is the basic difference that you have to understand as to what is the concept of positive secularism and negative secularism.
In fact, during the debates in the Constant Assembly, Pandit Zawarlal Nehru was not very favor of having this particular word secular in the preamble to the constitution. In fact, that is the reason why this particular word was not part of the original constitution. Because in the understanding of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru for himself, that secularism in real sense means negative secularism, that the state completely separates itself, itself from the matters of religion. But he also knew that in the background of partition and the communal riots in our country and the existing inter-religious as well as intra-religious problems in our country. When I talk of the intra-religious problem, within the religion also there is a lot of issues. There is discrimination within the caste, there is discrimination between the gender and there is also of course the inter-religious problems, religious issue between the Hindus and Muslims at the time of partition. So the constant assembly was very clear that uh, they allow to definitely intervene in the matters of religion. They cannot completely isolate themselves, separate themselves from the matters of religion. But this in true sense is not what is called as the secularism. And that's why pro preferably they thought that we will not put this particular word secular in the constitution. But otherwise there are a number of provisions in the constitution which makes India a secular state. Right to freedom of religion is there. There shall be no discrimination under Article 14 of the Constitution, equality before law, again under Article 14, right to vote irrespective of the religion. So, there are a number of secular characteristics and provisions, but then they thought that let us not put this particular word for the reasons that I have discussed. And this is also exactly the difference between as to what is the positive as well as the negative secularism. I hope the understanding of the word secular is very clear. So, to summarize, if you see what is secular, Secular means it is non-religious in character. The state does not identify itself with any religion. This is true both in case of positive as well as negative secularism. But however, how the Indian secularism is different from Western secularism? Because in Indian secularism, there is no complete separation between state and religion. But in Western secularism, complete separation between state and religion. Second, in India, the state can intervene in the matters of religion to bring in positive directions. And that is how they can... Uh, control the inter-religious as well as the intra-religious problems in our society. But whereas uh, such kind of diversity was not there in the western countries and hence they thought that there should be complete separation between the state and religion, between, between the authority of church and the authority of the king which happened in the, the dispute that happened in the medieval, king, medieval era and gradually they followed this particular system. So they followed the non-interventionist approach. And then here in India, religion can be the basis of public policy, religious specific laws can be made but that is strictly prohibited in the western countries. So, this exactly is the difference between the positive secularism and the negative secularism and also the understanding of the word secular. Now, we will move to the next keyword in the constitution that is democratic. So, what is this democratic? So, democratic means it is ruled by people or you can say this word democratics Sorry, the word democratic was uh, is, is, is part of two words that is demos plus kratos. Demos means people and kratos means rule. So, to put it in a very simple way, it is what? It is nothing but rule by people. So, that is what is called as democratic. So, in a democracy, who is going to rule? In a democracy, the rule will be done by the people or Anyone who will rule this particular country is can be done only by the popular support and will of the people. And if you look into the constitution of India, it is very much true that there are regular elections. So, any country which has got democracy, it has got certain characteristics. So, what are the characteristics? There will be regular elections. So, do we have regular elections in our country? Yes, of course, we have got regular elections. The constitution of India says that every five years, there shall be election to the Lok Sabha. Not only an election to the Lok Sabha, but also election to the various legislative assemblies also. So, every five years regular election and we also have a free and fair election, which is to be done by an independent body. That is the election commission of India is there to ensure a free and fair election that without any malpractice in the electoral uh, process. And then we have also got apart from the regular elections and the free and fair elections, we also have what is universal adult suffrage. Universal adult suffrage that every adult individual shall have the right to vote. So, in all these things work makes what is called as a democracy and regular elections are conducted and from the elections people representatives will come and these representatives form the government 
and on behalf of the people, these representatives will carry out the administration. Now, please understand the representatives will carry out the administration and that is a government will carry out the administration and that government is accountable to the people's representative that is the members of parliament and the members of parliament are in turn accountable to the people. So, this is how the country wherever there is a democracy that the government functions. So, now, so this is the principle that the constituent assembly of India has envisaged for India. And in any democracy, this is very important, and in any democracy, what are the certain characteristic features? And these characteristic features will also be there in India, similar to that of other democracies. So, first of all, the people will have their own set of rights and liberties. And wherever there is rights and liberties, which is guaranteed under the constitution, that there will also be what is called as constitutionalism or limitation upon the powers of the state. or limitation upon the powers of the state. That is, the power of the state is limited because the country has to be governed according to the principles that is laid down in the constitution. So, there is a limitation upon the powers of the state. There is rights and liberties, limitation upon the powers of the state. This also ensures that is there is what is called as rule of law. That means, once there are certain rights and liberties and there is a limitation upon the powers of the state, there is no much scope for any arbitrary function which can be carried out by the state. So, the constitution also envisages that the kind of state in India is a democratic state. And on the contrary, if you take some of the other constitutions which are authoritarian or totalitarian regime and you see that basic difference between a democratic regime versus an authoritarian or a totalitarian regime is that in an authoritarian or a totalitarian regime where there is no rights to the people. There cannot be criticism against the government. There is strict intolerance to the criticism and you cannot expect a rule of law there because uh, there everything is done according to the whims and fancies of uh, the ruling authority. So, this is the basic difference, but India is definitely a democratic country and we have the provisions in the constitution that makes India a democracy. And then the next keyword in the preamble is once we understand the democracy is republic. And what exactly is the word republic? So, democratic means how the government is formed. And the republic is talking about or the word republic gives us an understanding as to how one becomes a head of the state. How one becomes a head of the state. So, for example, in India, who is a head of the state? The president is a head of the state. Now, please understand the president is the head of the state. The prime minister is not the head of the state. Unlike uh, some of the students might have the understanding that the prime minister is the head of the state. No, the prime minister is not the head of the state. The prime minister is the head of the government probably, the union government along with his council of ministers. But who is the head of the state? The head of the state is the president of India. The president of India is head of the state and how one becomes the president of India? And any country which is a republic, now please understand, anybody who becomes the head of the state in any country which is a republic country, they can come only through elections. The head of the state has to be elected or elections has to be there. Without elections, no one can become the head of the state. It does not matter whether the election is a direct election or an indirect election, but how one can become the head of the state, it can be done only by the elections. It can be indirect as in the case of India or it can be direct also as in certain other countries. So, but it has to happen only by way of election. So, republic means that there is no special privileges for certain categories of people who by that special privilege can occupy certain posts. That is not possible. In India, all the officers are open to all the eligible people and they can contest the election and they can get into that particular office. That is the meaning behind the word republic. So, again I am repeating it. Republic means that the head of the state always is elected either by a direct election or by an indirect election. As we will proceed, we will understand that uh, for the president of India who is the head of the state, how he is elected and why it is an indirect election which we will discuss at the later stage. But however, if you see against the concept of republic, there can also be another way as to one how he or she can become the head of the state is also through what is called as hereditary succession. 
if somebody becomes a head of a state by hereditary succession, that means there is no republic in that particular country. That means the post is reserved for someone from a royal family who becomes a head of the state by hereditary succession. And such form of a state is what is called as monarchy. And such form of government is monarchy and where the head of the state comes through a hereditary succession. In fact, United Kingdom is a monarchy, Japan is a monarchy, Netherlands is a monarchy and number of other countries. In fact, New Zealand is a monarchy. So, all these countries are monarchy. That one who becomes the head of the state is through hereditary succession. But whatever state that I have said, they are all examples of what is called as constitutional monarchy. When I talk of constitutional monarchy, in these states, the head of the state does not have the real power. They are just the nominal heads. They are not the real executives. The real executives are there in the hands of an elected government. But on the contrary, there are certain countries which follow the system of what is called as absolute monarchy. They follow absolute monarchy. So, what exactly is this absolute monarchy? So, absolute monarchy means here also the head of the state is through hereditary succession. But here the monarchy is the real power. So, that is the difference between the absolute monarchy and the constitutional monarchy. For example, Saudi Arabia is an example of uh, absolute monarchy. Not many countries in the world today are absolute monarchy, but Saudi Arabia is an example of absolute monarchy. So, this is exactly how we have to understand the nature of the Indian state. So, the preamble to the constitution of India is saying that we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, a supreme authority with regard to both its internal as well as external affairs, socialist, a state which is having concern towards the poor people, a state which will control certain means of production, if not all the means of production, basically to eliminate the poverty and inequality in the society. A secular state, a state which does not identify itself with any religion, but the state which can promote all the religion equally, a state which can provide aid to the religion, a state which can positively intervene in the religion, a state which can allow religion to be a basis of classification when it comes to certain laws. So, all these things can be done by the kind of secularism that we follow in India. And that's why probably we, we, we say that India is a positive secularism because it's a positive intervention in all these matters. A state which is democratic in nature where the government is always elected by the people and it is ultimately controlled by the people because of the various provisions in the constitution and a state which is republic in nature which means the head of the state is always elected by the people. So, by this we are done with the understanding of the first set of uh, keywords which talks about the nature of the Indian states. Now, let us proceed further and we will try to understand the next set of words that is what is the purpose that this preamble wanted to serve to the people of this particular country and if you look into the purpose as to what this particular constitution is to serve, the constitution wanted to provide justice, liberty, equality and fraternity to all its citizens. So, what exactly is justice, liberty, equality and fraternity? How these provisions are reflected in the various provisions of the constitution? Because the preamble is merely a summary of the entire constitution as we already discussed. And also we will try to understand as to whether a preamble is a part of the constitution that is an integral part of the constitution and can the preamble be amended and the significance of the preamble to the great constitution. But we will continue our discussion in the next class. To get maximum benefit out of this series, Indian Polity by M. Lakshmikant, try to watch all the videos. And if you want to have the PDF of these uh, lectures, you can download it from my Telegram channel that is Babu Guna Shekharan 337. So, that is where you can get the PDF of these files. So, keep watching and to get the maximum benefit, as I already said, keep watching all the lectures. Thank you very much. All the best. God bless.